but it's possible to be a born again believer and not necessarily be shining truth. Because if on the other hand, you're allowing yourself to be fathered by the father of lies, what will come out of you is lies. And the title of my message is, A House of His Presence is a House of Light. A House of Light. And of course, a house that's filled with light is a lighthouse. And I didn't intend that to be kind of, you know, a bit twee. But I'm a grandfather now, so I come out with grandfather jokes, which are even worse than dad jokes. <laughs> and, uh, and so a house of light is a lighthouse. And I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of 1 John and chapter 1 and verse 5 to verse 10. Holy Spirit, I ask you that you'd pastor each one of us. I ask that you'd preach through me and to me and to each of us. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would cause each of us to be houses of light and that that light would be Jesus. And that we as a whole community, as a body, this tiny expression of your global body of Christ, let us be a house of light. And let us be a lighthouse right here in North Carolina and to the nation and to the nations of the world. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John says in verse 5, This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Fasten your seatbelts, everybody. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.14, you are the light of the world. John 8.12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And we're much more comfortable with that. Oh yeah, Jesus, he's the light of the world. Me? Are you kidding me? How could I be the light of the world? Well, I've got good news for you. The Greek is plural. It actually says, ye are the light of the world in the King James Version because the translators of the King James translating the original Greek text into English, they didn't have a word for you plural. So they had to invent a word. Ye. It's not Old English. It's an invented word by the King James translators so that the reader could understand whenever Scripture was speaking to you, plural, you individual, and, but then delineate to you plural. Of course, if they were from North Carolina, there'd have been no problem. They'd have just said y'all. Or all y'all, actually. Because <laughs> it seems to me that we're a little confused in North Kakalaki that we still say y'all to somebody on their own. Anyway, uh, moving swiftly on. By the way, I hope you all enjoyed... Y'all, do you see how... Hope you all enjoyed the July 4th celebrations and the holidays. It was amazing. And Kate and I are just so proud and blessed and thankful to Jesus that we're American citizens. I might sound English, but I'm actually an American citizen and very, very blessed to be so. And thankful for our, for our nation 
our founding fathers, and all those who've contributed to this nation being amazing. That makes me an immigrant, which is very special in the eyes of God. He says, welcome in the stranger. So if you want to invite me over to your house and just feel, I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. You, plural, ye, all y'all are the light of the world. Then he goes on to say, you know, let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds, your works. Actually, that, that word right there is not your capacity to build houses, although I'm very excited for our team that are building houses. And, and actually, as Kate said, we built a house in, in Dominican Republic. And, and you know, as I was shoveling endless cement and sand and mixing it all up and you know, sweating buckets because it was like, it felt like 125 degrees and uh, I was just like, just dripping. Suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, the anointing in my life is in my sweat and it's going into this cement and th into the bricks and everything that's going to be built. And this house is built with the anointing of every single one of our team into that cement. So just remember that while you're in Dominican Republic. And those people that are being gifted this house are being gifted a house that's built by the anointing. Wow, I, th I thought that was amazing. And, uh, but that word right there is not just the physical works. It's actually much more so the energies of God, the ergons, the works, the same works that Jesus said in John uh, chapter tw uh, 14, verse 12, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me, not only will they do the works that I do, but even greater works will they do in my name because I go to the Father. It's the supernatural works of God that distinguishes us as the people of God. The world is full of all kinds of really amazing charities that are doing really good philanthropic work. It's not philanthropic work that makes you the light of the world. It's the Holy Spirit in you and the works that only He can do in you and through you, in us and through us, that distinguishes us as the light of the world. And so Jesus said that they may see your good works, your supernatural works, and praise your Father in heaven. We had somebody just this morning came all the way from Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, how did I say it? Greenville. Say it? Greenville. 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 Okay, anyway, somewhere green. And, uh, you know, they, they came here four hours, they said, because they needed healing. I'm so glad they got healed. Aren't you so glad they got healed? They're going home healed. So if we're the light of the world, which we are, and our supernatural works that we can do, which we can, will cause praise of our Father in heaven, wouldn't it be amazing to be a house of light? I want you to turn with me to Luke, because Luke 11, Jesus says, some pretty mysterious things. Luke 11 and verse 33, a parallel scripture of Matthew 5, 14. No one, when they've lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is evil, your body also is full of darkness. Here we go. Here's the mystery. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light. As when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. In Matthew 6, verse 23, a parallel passage of scripture, Jesus says, take care that the light that's in you is not darkness, for great will that darkness be. Evidently, 
We can be filled with light and that light be darkness. Ooh. And that is mysterious to me. And I started to ask the Lord to help me to understand this. Lord, how can you be saying and declaring that we're the light of the world, which we are, when we know that you're the light because you're the true light of the world and you dwell within us, so therefore we're the light of the world because you, the lamp of God, is in us. The eternal word of God is the lamp of God. You're in us. You're shining through us. So yes, I understand that we can be the light of the world. But God, would you just show me the mystery? How could it be possible that there could be light in me that's actually darkness? And the problem with deception is it's deception. The problem when you're deceived is that you're deceived, so you don't actually realize that you're deceived. If you did, you wouldn't be deceived. You'd be like, no, no, that's not for me. Thank you very much. We know that Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And because he's the truth and because he's the light, when we're walking in the truth, his light shines and emanates from us. But it's possible to be a born-again believer and not necessarily be shining truth. Because if, on the other hand, you're allowing yourself to be fathered by the father of lies, what will come out of you is lies. See, in James 1.17, our heavenly daddy is referred to by James as the father of lights. It's easy to kind of like, oh, the father of lights. What's the father of lights? Well, actually, it's the exact same word in Greek as you are the light of the world. So he's the father of light. And the true light, Jesus, came into the world. And those who believe in Jesus now become the light of the world because a union with the light of the world himself, Jesus, makes us now the lights of the world. The problem, though, is that there's another father. And as my friend Carlos Rodriguez was the first to say in my ears anyway, you're either going to be fathered by one of two fathers in this world, every human being. You're either going to be fathered by the father of light or you're going to be fathered by the father of lies. Father of lies. That's John 8, 44. Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. And so this got me thinking, oh, I get it. That's what the light is in me that's darkness. It's the lies. You see, light brings revelation. God is revelation. He brings revelation. The Word of God brings revelation. But also, lies bring revelation. Just the wrong kind of revelation. And the enemy has been working in your life and in my life since we were born, well, even prior to us being born in other generations, but in our own lives, he's been working from the moment we were conscious to put his lies into our heart and father us through those lies. There's not one single one of us that by the age in this room that by the age of five had not already tasted and had an opportunity to be fathered by the father of lies. I want you to Flip your page if you've got one of these ancient books that has paper. Otherwise, use your cell phone and try not to look at the WhatsApp that just came in. Or the text or whatever else. Or try not to surf while I'm preaching. In verse 24 of the same chapter of Luke, we read, When an unclean spirit goes out of a person... that." That spirit goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none says to himself, I will return to my house from which I came. And when that spirit comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then that spirit goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. I was going to call the message, house of his presence is not this house. 
And then when I was telling Jess, when Jess and Aaron were asking me, our lead pastors were asking me, what are you going to be preaching on next Sunday while we're on vacation? You know, lead pastors can take vacation like you can take vacation from your work. And so uh, I said, well, this is what, and I was really, you know, and they're like, yeah, we don't like that title. That's, that's not the greatest title. And, you know, when I was, when I was in my mid-30s and I was relaxing one afternoon, I'd, I think I'd been preaching in Toronto and I was having a nap. There's nothing like a Sunday afternoon nap. And I was just about to go for a nap and I had this thought, I just kind of felt a little bit low. Do you ever feel a little bit low? You don't know why, you just feel a little low. Careful of those low feelings. And as I'm having one of those feelings of just feeling a little low, I got in touch. Why am I feeling low? I know it's because I'm not a plumber, so I'm not raising plumbers. I'm not a mechanic, so I'm not teaching my children how to be mechanics. I, I don't know how to build houses, so I'm not teaching my three girl, our three girls how to, how to build houses. And then um, I'm not an electrician, so I'm not teaching them how to be electricians. And then I heard the Holy Spirit, and I was feeling really low about it. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, stop. Who are you? I said, I'm your son, Heavenly Daddy. He said, exactly. And what do you do? I said, well, I'm a preacher. What, what, I, what have I called you to do? I said, you've called me to be a preacher. So what do you do? I preach. He said, then teach your children how to preach. I'm like, oh, duh, uh. Yeah, so when I was talking with Jess and telling her about the title of my message, and she said, Dad, I don't like that title. I think you should call it House of Light. I'm like, man, that's so good, honey. And it was so, such a lovely moment for me because normally she runs her sermons by me and I'll, tell, I'll help her. This time I'm running my sermon by her and she's helping me. So thank God for our amazing lead pastors. And as I, the reason I was going to say not this house is because right here is the mystery of where the darkness that's light in you comes from. You see, I've always thought that I'll return to my house, the demon says. Jesus is referring, that the demon is referring to the human being. And then one day the Holy Spirit showed me, you've got that wrong, Duncan, because there's never been a time in all of history where I created a human to be a demon's house. Every human being is created by God to be God's dwelling place. But the enemy, knowing that, came right in, afforded by the opportunity by our ancestors, Adam and Eve, who we all came from, and we were all in them when they ate the wrong fruit, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, instead of the fruit of life, and deceived them. The father of lies came and deceived them. And he began to build a house in humanity, a house of darkness. And he still continues to do that. And the Holy Spirit showed me that there are seven particularly nasty, nasty demons. Perhaps even, I'm just saying this, but I don't know, perhaps even principalities and powers, I don't know. But what I do know is that there are at least seven very nasty spirits that will try to build a house in you and I, in our mind and in our emotions, affecting our will so that our body, souls, and even spirits are given over to their will. And you say, what? I'm a born again believer. That's right. The moment you became a born again believer, those spirits left you, but their houses didn't necessarily. And they probably perched on some nearby tree, squawking away without you being able to hear it. And they're looking and they're waiting to see whether you as a born again believer, no one understand that actually there's a house that they built in you that's rightfully their dwelling place if you in your will through revelation don't actually withdraw your will from that house. You see, the house is a stronghold. And the problem with a stronghold is that it gets a stronghold of you. And I want to tell you right now, so that you can start to live out of revelation in the light of the word of God, that those strongholds 
can be broken and cannot, can not just be broken, but can be completely destroyed and removed from your life. And if they are, you will live a life so full of the Holy Spirit that the light of God will shine through you in every moment. Shine through in your marriage, shine through in your work, shine through in your, your life in the church, shine through in everything that you do. But if you don't dismantle those strongholds, those demons will have a place of occupation to cause you to be occupied with a hell's agenda instead of heaven's mandate without you even knowing it. You're, I'm not talking about salvation. You're still saved. I'm talking about your thoughts and actions. I'm talking about what fruit you spend your life producing. And, uh, and either the delicious fruit of the tree of life or the disgusting fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that all of your friends and family and colleagues have to put up with. So, what are these seven well, number one, a nasty spirit, unclean spirit called abandonment. See, you and I think that the worst issues of sin, we automatically, we go to adultery, we go to murder, and rightly so. Those are really bad sins. But every person who's committed adultery or every person that's committed murder, they were not born with a desire instantly to go and live their life to do just that. Something happened along the journey that allowed the enemy to get such a foothold in them that they committed those sins. Some much more deadly sins that you don't spend time thinking about. Number one, abandonment. Abandonment is a deadly sin. Because the reality is, there's actually never been a moment that human beings have been abandoned. Because God is our Father, He's the Father of all human beings, and He has never abandoned a single one of us. Even Adolf Hitler was not abandoned by God. However, every single human being has believed the father of lies, who's come along and whispered into their hearts, Afforded by the opportunity of the circumstances that were happening in their young childhood and whispered into their hearts and said, see, you're abandoned. Ooh, and that, that lie, if we were centered in our father's love when we were three years old, we would have said, no, I'm not. My heavenly daddy loves me and he's always with me. But you see, Satan, who's just the meanest, nastiest, and all of his demons are just the same, he didn't tell us the truth. He whispered the lie. You've been abandoned. You'll always be abandoned. Then comes number two nasty evil spirit. When that spirit sees that you've believed the lie of abandonment, comes along and says, yes, and you've also been rejected. See, I want you to think in those days when Jesus was talking about houses and these unclean spirits referring, I'm going to go back to my house. Houses were made of clay bricks and mortar made of mud. And so I want you to think for just a moment for illustration purposes that the house that the demons have built in the heart of and minds of every human being is made of bricks and mortar. He said, well, what kind of bricks? The bricks are the lies that the father of lies sows, and the mortar is yours and my will agreement around those bricks that takes that brick and makes it part of me. And that's what makes that stronghold have such a stronghold over you. Your will is part of it. That's why you can be delivered, but if you don't get rid of the house, the stronghold, those demons will come back, even though the rest of you is full of the Holy Spirit. Because your will agreement is still part of it. But I got good news, everybody. That's what makes it so weak. Because all we have to do is withdraw our will and now all of a sudden those bricks are like loose stack of cards and one puff of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that, that, was, that, that just wasn't very anointed, was it? <laughs> that wasn't either, I'm gonna give up. Okay, <laughs> and bam, that whole bunch of bricks or 
Lies just comes crashing down because there's nothing to hold it together. And that spirit that's been living in that stronghold has nowhere to run and is naked now and exposed. And all you have to do is say, out. And boom, it goes running. And it's gone. Those little pigs are going, and go squealing out. That's the end of it. Because without, it's, it's the house that makes it have such a strong hold on you. Because you're part of it. Your will agreement. But that is what makes it so weak. Hallelujah. And so along comes another nasty spirit. Number three, unworthiness. The reason you've been rejected is because you're unworthy. You're unworthy of everything. You suck. You're an idiot. You're stupid. There's not a person in this room that hasn't called themselves stupid in their thoughts. That's unworthiness. Lying to you. Confirming your worst fear. And then because I'm unworthy, that's why I get rejected. And that's why I'm going to be abandoned. All those lies get wrapped up together. Nasty houses. And then comes something that the Kilstras taught us. Then comes these other three spirits, four, five, and six. Shame, fear, and control. And shame has been there from the very beginning when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that they were told not to. Shame is a lie of the devil. You were never created for shame. You were created by honor himself for honor. You were created for honor. You are honorable. You're an amazing creation. You're more honorable than anything else that's ever been created. You know, Mars and, and Venus have been close together in the sky, making them very bright for the last few weeks. You are more honor, more honorable, more glorious, more fantastic, more extraordinary and beautiful than those stars, those planets rather. You are more beautiful and important to God than a billion stars. They're only there so that you could have maximum joy in your life. But you don't believe it. I don't believe it. We believe the lies of shame. And then comes fear. Because we're so ashamed, we're worried that everybody's going to find out that we're unworthy and that we're stupid and that we're not actually, um, we're not capable, we're failures and, and, and we're full of sin. And I mean, after all, look at the lies you told when you were little and what about all the pornography and masturbation that you do that nobody knows about? What about the overspending on your credit card that nobody knows about? What about the cheating on your taxes that nobody knows about? What about all the anger? You look so amazing when you're in the church and then when you get home, you just fly off the handle at everybody. We know about that. You suck. And we're all like... <laughs> The enemy wants to deconstruct the church so that he can continue constructing his strongholds. I'm not going to say it again. You heard it. And so, it's so important to us, everybody, that we have fellowship with one another because we're all in the same boat. Now along comes control and says, hey, listen, if you just do what I tell you, you will never experience abandonment because you'll never be rejected. No one will ever find out, find, find out that you're unworthy. And then you'll never have to be afraid again. Just do what I tell you. Be cool. Be the best musician. Oh, gee, you suck at music. Oh, don't worry. Be the best sports person. Oh, my gosh, there's not an athletic bone in your body. Don't worry. Be the most intelligent person. Oh, dear, you're pretty stupid, aren't you? Okay, don't worry about it. Oh, look at this. You're born again Christian now. Okay, read your Bible more than everybody else. 
Oh, you're not that good at that either. Oh, I know what. Why don't you be the most prayerful? Yeah, you know, join that 24-7 prayer group. Yeah, <laughs> Then nobody will find out that you and I know a little secret about each other. You suck. You're a born-again sucker. And then along comes number seven, rebellion. Because there's no human being that can hold all that down. And we just want to rebel and make our mark on something. And it's pretty easy anyway because we've already lost touch with the God who loves us. Or rather, we've lost touch that the God who is loves us. We're born again. We know that we're sons and daughters, or maybe we don't even. Maybe we were born again into religion. We're truly born again, born of the Spirit. We're not talking about salvation. But there's so much religion that control has just gone ballistic. And there's nothing like religion to allow control to flex its enormous muscles. And here's the thing about control, everybody. It's so deceptive that you don't even realize you're full of it. In fact, you're convinced that everyone around you is a control freak. My mom's a control freak. My dad's a control freak. My pastor's a control freak. My friends are control freaks. My wife is the biggest control freak of all. My husband is the biggest control freak. My best friends are control freaks. Everybody's a control freak. I got good news for you. That kind of thinking is probably a really good window into the fact that you'd like to be in control of all of those people. Which makes you the biggest control freak of all. So if you think people are control freaks, if you can spot a control freak, it's probably because you're the biggest control freak. Because if it bothers you, it's because you got it in spade loads. And there's nothing that bothers a control freak more than when they're out of control. Because someone else is trying to control them. All right. I got good news, everybody. You are not fathered by the father of lies when you're in the kingdom of heaven. You're fathered by the father of light. He is your true father. You are not sons and daughters of the darkness any longer. You are children of the light. Ephesians chapter 5 says this as we close. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk therefore as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather bring them out into the light. For it is, a shame, it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done in secret. But all things that are exposed are manifested by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Folks, my favorite thing about the church is that I walk with a community that I can share life with, truth with, and be vulnerable with. And in a healthy church, being vulnerable and sharing our sin and our struggles is the very thing that increases our, our fellowship with one another and the light and the glory that shimmers from us to the world. Yes. A church where everyone, leaders included, try to cover up and make out that they don't have any sin and they don't have any struggles. Just run a mile from that. Exactly, we've all sinned and we're all grateful for the blood of Jesus. But don't ever kid yourself that now you're born again, you no longer have a struggle with sin. And don't kid yourself that the sin that is happening in your life, okay, is no longer required to bring into the light. 
What you bring into the light, you will overcome. What you keep in the darkness will overcome you, even though you're born again. You see, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, you are in Christ Jesus, and in Christ Jesus, you are now a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But don't take that and think, therefore, I don't need any healing in my heart. I don't need to be transparent about my vulnerabilities, about my weaknesses. I don't need to bring my sins into the light. I just need to confess the word and be an overcomer. Well, I got news for you. When you do that, those spirits will live in that house that they made. It belongs to them, but you're part of it. And they will make sure that even though you're confessing at 100 miles an hour into the mirror, that you're this, that, and the other in Christ Jesus, your life will be led into greater levels of darkness. How else do you think pastors, leaders, business leaders, who are born again believers and full of the Holy Spirit, end up, turns out they've got adultery, they've got homosexual lifestyle, they've got this, they've got that, they've got the other, whatever it might be. Or it turns out that they've cheated on their finances. How does that happen? It's because they're not willing to bring into the light the issues of their hearts. They're not willing to confess the reality of their sins one to another. As leaders, they've become above and aloof instead of being humble and transparent. And if you ever see me being prideful and aloof, and you don't find that we're being, Kate, myself, Aaron, Jess, all of the leaders in this church, if you don't find us being humble and transparent about our issues, please, you have our full blessing. Come and talk to us because we want to have fellowship and be in the light, one with each other. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's... And I'm really, really pleased to let you know that despite the fact that I've skimmed over an extraordinarily deep subject, you can as a member of this church, you can avail yourself of a whole bunch of ministry for inner healing, healing of life's hurts, transformation of your inner man. You, there are a number of people in this church, even the very founders of RTF, Restoring the Foundations themselves are members of this church. There are now, thankfully, a number of other amazing ministers of Restoring the Foundations, Heart Sync, Sozo, Theophostics. There are so many different things. And if you're sitting there going, what in the world is he talking about? Find out. Find out. Find out from their friends. Come talk to me. Come talk to the pastors. Come talk to your prayer ministry teams, your connect group leaders. You probably won't be able to talk to me because I'm out of the country most of the time. But find your connect group leader and say, talk to me about RTF. What in the world did that Duncan Smith guy mean when he said RTF? What is RTF? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. And they'll let you know. And then you can spend time with people that will lovingly listen to you bringing issues into the light, just as Chester and Betsy have done for Kate and I. And so many times we've sat on their couch and we've shared with them the worst of our lives and they've lovingly ministered to us as we've confessed our sin, as they've helped us to withdraw our will from those strongholds. We've been set free from abandonment, set free from rejection, set free from unworthiness, set free from lifetime patterns of, of shame, set free from fear, set free from control. Kate and I are the number one bickerers on planet Earth. But we've managed to make our way down to about number 10 now. From number one, we've gone to about number 10. We managed to drive 14 hours down from Toronto and we probably bickered about twice. As opposed to 10 years ago, we'd have bickered probably for a, about 12 hours of the 14 hours. How? 
How? Prayer ministry teams filled with the glory of God that have ministered to us as we've humbled ourselves and told our need and expressed our need. We don't want to be all singing, all dancing, powerful leaders. We want to be leaders who carry the all singing, all dancing, powerful one, Jesus Christ himself and be found in him and him found in us. Let's stand everybody. The house of his presence is a house of light. You cannot practice sin. You cannot practice sin. No matter how secret you might think it is, you cannot practice sin without a f- that sin, secret as it is, affecting all of the believers in this room. Your issue with pornography, masturbation, your issue with alcohol, your issue with medical drugs, your issue with lying for convenience, those issues, they affect every one of us in this room. It's time everybody to realize, I must be a house of light filled with Jesus, but also be a steward of making sure that in my no to sin, it becomes God's yes to the whole community being a house of light so that we can truly become a lighthouse in this world together, together, amen. All right, we're gonna do some business and then I'll hand over to Kate. Say this with me. We're gonna have some corporate deliverance. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna deal with those seven strongholds. The good news is because of the power of the cross, because of 1 John 3 verse eight, for this reason, Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And he did it. We can, in a moment like this, make a very simple start to a life of cleansing. You see, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Paul says, therefore, because of all these promises, promises of what? That we're sons and daughters and God is our heavenly father. That we're his dwelling place. That we're his people and he's our God. Verse 7 says this, therefore, let us, because of these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles us. Perfecting holiness in body and spirit. In the fear of the Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this moment. Though we're all probably in the main, born again, new creations, you want us to cleanse ourselves. And today we position our hearts to do just that. So say this with me, everybody. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. The truth is, since I was little, I've agreed with and believed the lies of abandonment, rejection, unworthiness, shame, fear, control, and rebellion, and witchcraft. I didn't have time to go into that. And right now, I ask that you'd wash me with the precious blood of Jesus and clean me, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I just let the precious blood of Jesus cleanse you from all that defilement. Say this with me. In the name of Jesus, I withdraw my will from all of those lies. No longer will I believe that I'm abandoned, that I'm rejected, that I'm unworthy, that I'm full of shame, that I'm full of fear, that I'm full of control and rebellion and witchcraft. I withdraw my will in Jesus' name from all of those lies. And I command the house of the evil one, the houses of the evil one in my mind, in my emotions, in my body, soul, and spirit, 
come crashing down now in Jesus' name. And I command every spirit that occupied and helped build those houses to leave me now in the name of Jesus. Now take a deep breath of the Holy Spirit in and breathe all those lies out, those spirits out. Out they go. <sighs> breathe them out. Out they go. Say that with me. Out you go. Out all y'all. Now listen, you didn't feel them go in, so you don't need to feel them go out. Now just take a moment and welcome the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, would you build in me a life fully built on the truth of Jesus Christ? I'm being obedient to him. Teach me your voice, Holy Spirit. Keep me centered in the Father's love. Woo. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you really enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe and also click on that notifications button. Also, click on the links below. We have lots of resources for you to enjoy that we believe will help you to live an amazing supernatural life in the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless. See you next time.